Right. And so Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read verses 3 through 5. All right, Lord, help us today. <clears throat> it says, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. You know, and, um, and, and so what we want to know is how do we help people without fixing people, right? We all want to help. We all, you know, we, especially out of a good heart, right? And that's why I say fixers get misunderstood because their heart is, most of the time, like we could, we could say like their heart is really good. Their heart wants to help someone, especially if they've been through that situation, especially if they've seen, you know, what happens when you go down the road, you know, especially, you know, if they're close to them, they're like, hey, you don't have to go through that. Don't do that, you know. And so we try to fix, but it doesn't mean that it's, that we're doing it the right way, right? And then we get misunderstood. And, and so how do we fix how do we help without fixing, okay? Um, and one of the things uh, is the, the general idea of this is we want to facilitate an environment where they can work and heal their heart along with God, okay? So if you remember, one of the things that we're called to do is to point people to God, point people to Jesus. And so if I can create an environment in which God and people work to heal the pain, right, it will solve every problem in the environment of love and acceptance, and so if they feel safe, they will be able to address the issue. If they don't feel safe, they're going to they're gonna be closed up, right? If I feel like you're trying to fix me because you're so high and mighty, I'm not going to open up my heart. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to want to listen to what you're saying. I'm going to want this conversation to end as soon as possible, right? Like, oh, man, can't wait for this to be over. And I'm going to tell you whatever you want to hear also. So we need to work first on becoming a safe place for people, and that starts in our mind and in our heart and, you know, not making a judgment against them. And so people feel safe to address their issues when, you know, when there's love and when there's no judgment. But when we attempt to fix people without an invitation, we put them in self-defense mode. And God, God, God himself can't work when somebody's in defense mode, right, because Again, we might be able to pick some of the outward fruit, but we won't be able to get to the heart. Man, I'm telling you, this parenting series, series on Wednesday, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to help you a lot. You need to catch up and come on Wednesday because it's about how do you reach your kid's heart. If you don't have their heart, you know, all you're doing is just modifying their behavior so that they look good and they don't, you know, embarrass you. And sometimes parents are just in that survival mode, like, okay, I don't care about anything. Just don't move and don't talk. <laughs> like, we, we don't want to be those parents. Like, you know, we, we want to get to their heart in and, and, and a place where they understand, like, we have a relationship with them that we want to last for a lifetime. You know, so, so if I lose your heart, then I lost everything. And so... Anyway, so th this is very helpful for parenting as well, okay? Um, so, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. From my perspective as a pastor, um, and, I, and I've said this many times, our job is not to fix you or change you. If we tried, we'd probably mess you up more. Like, uh, that's the truth, you know? Like, you don't want me with a scalpel opening up your heart because I have a good intention. <laughs> right? No, because I'm not fit to do, to do that work. And a lot of times people are trying to take the job of the Holy Spirit and do that with people. And we can't do that with people. The best thing we can do for them is love them and point them to God, right? And, and, and create an environment where they feel safe and they feel the love of God. You know, I'm supposed to project God's love onto people. Like people will know God and will know the Father, you know, through my life. You know, Jesus came to earth to do that very thing. He came to present to us the Father. He gave us an exact picture of what the Father is like, how the Father speaks, what the Father does. And everything that he did was a reflection of his Father, right? And that's, that's our job, you know, towards our children, towards our spouse, towards people. It's like, I want to be a reflection of God's love. <clears throat> and so, 
instead of trying to fix people, I want to create a safe place and I want to point them to God so that they feel safe to open their heart. But in order to be able to do that genuinely, I cannot have a judgment against them. Because if I have a judgment, you know what also comes with judgment? An attitude. Right? You can, in an attitude, yeah, you can feel it. And so people are going to feel, they're going to know. And so, you know, part of what this scripture is saying here is like, hey, hold on. Before you go try to remove a plank of someone else, you really have to get your heart in the right place. You have to, you have to take care of, of, of your thoughts, of your feeling, of your judgments toward this person, because otherwise you can't help them. Okay, um, as pastors, we feed the sheep, right? We feed the congregation, and we speak into our leaders, you know, um, but we don't try to fix people. You know, I gave you this example last week. You know, some people will come in from a mega church, and they will feel like saying hi to them every week and learning their name is getting up all in the business, right? And be like, what? You know, like this pastor, like what's his intention, right? And, and then other people will come from a, a way smaller church into this church and feel completely neglected because they haven't been to my house. <laughs> so what's really our job? You know, our, our, our job is, is to feed, you know, to prepare a meal and to feed the people, right? And that's what Jesus told Peter to do is like feed, feed, my, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. You know, feed, if you love me, you know, love my people. And so that's our job, right? We speak into lives, but we don't try to fix everyone. And let me tell you, we have a lot of temptation with that subject. <laughs> because the la- you know that our heart is not to see the every chair filled up. Like, that's great. That happens just because it's a healthy place. But that's not like, we're not like, oh, man, like, you got to bring someone. You got to bring someone because there's an empty chair next to you. And then you, how could you let that chair be empty? No, like, that's not our goal. Our goal is to see you prosper, to see you flourish. You know, like, like John said, you know, that, that you would prosper in everything you do as your soul prospers. You know, and, and so when we see that, you know, it makes us really happy because it means that you're growing. It means that you're healthy, right? And, if, um, and so we're not trying to fix people, but when people ask for help and there's an invitation to speak into their lives, that's a different story. You see what I'm saying? Like... If somebody asks me, hey, you know, sometimes people come and say like, hey, so we're moving out of state and we just want to let you know. That's great. You know, I'm, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to celebrate you. And, and that's kind of sad. But, you know, uh, there's others that come and say, hey, we're praying about this. Would you pray with us about the situation? You know, and then that's an invitation, you know, say, okay, we're going to be in agreement. You're acknowledging like, a spiritual authority, so we're going to engage with you, not control you, but we're going to pray with you, and we're going to tell you, you know, what we see and the wisdom that God gives us. But at the end of the day, you can make your own choice, and we're going to love you regardless. But you can't do that if you have a judgment. We can't really be genuine with someone if we have a judgment. And when you have a judgment, there's also another agenda there, you know. And so our, our, you know, our job is to feed people and then to be there for those that, you know, say, hey, would you help me with this? Would you help me with this? To what level, you know, do you, do you want help in your life, you know? And we'd love to do that. And there's so many tools and so many things that we have, but it doesn't mean, here's the thing, it doesn't mean that every sheep is a disciple, right? Because not every, you know, we, we're not controlling the sheep. We feed them, we guide them, but they're free. They're God's sheep, everybody, you know. And so we're going to do our best, you know. And if you choose to jump the fence and go somewhere else, we'll be like, oh, bless you. We're here if you want to come back. You know, so, so it, you know, it gives you a little more clarity on, like, what are we here to do? Well, we're going to feed you, and we're going to love you, and we're not going to judge you. And if you want us to speak more into your life, just ask. We'll pray with you. We'll believe with you. We'll stand with you. And if you choose different than what we, than what we recommended or what we felt was wisdom, guess what? We're not going to go, oh, well, that's because, no. We're not going to make a judgment, right? It's because you're so, 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 so. (laughs) 
right? And then be able to love you. And how many people have you given advice before and they went against your advice and then you made a judgment against them? You wrote them off, (laughs) completely wrote them off, right? Because you're like, that's it, you know, never listen. They're so dumb, dumb sheep, dumb sheep. Mm -mm. I'm not doing this anymore. We write people off sometimes. Why do we write people off sometimes instead of keeping our love on towards them? It's hard to keep your love on towards someone that you've made a judgment against. It's really hard to love someone whom you have a judgment against. (laughs) Because you have this whole list of things that you think about them, right? And they should have, and they shouldn't have, and they should have, and how come they didn't, right? And so it's hard to love them from that place. Okay. Um, Jesus never focused on what was wrong with people. Jesus never focused on what was wrong with people. Right? Um, he focused on, on what was good with them. He was the one telling them what was right with them. And that's what people need. People need to know what's right with them. You know, they already know what's wrong with them. Um, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. You know, it, it tells us in John, 16, that that he is the spirit of truth. He's the one leading us into truth. And so when we create this environment of safety, an environment where people can can open up their hearts, then it becomes amazing because now you're collaborating with the Holy Spirit and pointing him to them, right? And teaching people how to hear God's voice for themselves. It's one of the things that happens in Sozo. You know, a lot of people are scared of going to Sozo and they because they, they don't understand, but uh, 98% or 99% of people that go to Sozo, they go, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I didn't know that. You know, because, because they're, again, they've had past pain, and then we project that past pain into what our future experiences are probably going to be, and so therefore we, we walk in fear of anything, right? And so one of the things that happens in Sozo is that you just have two people praying with you and helping you hear from God, but you hear God for yourself. You know, the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. So we are all equipped to hear God's voice for ourselves. And I know that's a new concept for a lot of people that have been, you know, under controlling environments or very religious sets that, you know, where where there's only one person that hears from God and they will tell you what God is saying and then you better do it. That's kind of crazy, but it's so normal in so many places, right? But it's, it's not God's way. And so he said, my sheep hear my voice. That means all of us can hear God's voice. Now, do we miss it sometimes? Yes. We're humans, you know. You know, right now, how many of you received a a prophetic word during during worship from someone? You know, okay. There's there's quite a few of you. You know, um, it's different than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the prophet was infallible. In the New Testament, we all have the Holy Spirit. We all have the ability to hear God and to hear what he's saying to us and sometimes what he wants to say to someone else. But it goes through our filter and through our things. And so, so one of the things that we've taught in this church is not just how, uh, how to give a prophetic word, but how to receive a prophetic word. And, and with the understanding that people are not infallible and they could be giving us a word that is 80%. And that's Okay. You know, and we've taught also how you receive a prophetic word is that, you know, you have the option to plant it in your heart because it's a confirmation or you shelf it, you put it on a shelf because it's just doesn't really make, it's not bad, but it maybe it's for another time. I'm not sure about it. Or it's just flat out terrible and you just flush it down the toilet and that's okay. But see, if we, if we're not safe and we make judgments and we go, oh, they're not spiritual. The prophetic word they gave me was terrible. And now we stop, you know, this freedom where people can grow and learn to hear God's voice and deliver it. Okay. I don't know how this turned into prophetic class. I should stick to my notes. <laughs> Our attention must, and must not be on people's problems. We can't take God's job and try to, you know, pull the plank out of their eyes. The Pharisees were great at this thing. They reduced the relationship with God to about 600 rules. 600 rules, you know? 
like relationship with God 101. Here, read this encyclopedia, and then you'll be done. Like, that's what the Pharisees did. They were externalists, okay? They were focused on the behavior. They were focused, you know, they were comparing. They were condemning. They were sizing people up. That's what the religious people do, okay? And so let's go to Matthew chapter 15, just a few, a few chapters ahead there. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 and 9, okay? It says, but these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. I, I just love that. That's, the, that's my favorite definition of religion. You know, uh, the man-made rules that make no sense. I add that. You know, man-made rules that make no sense. That's why, you know, to some of us people that are not religious, you know, it's really hard to follow man-made rules that make no sense. I'm just saying, you know, you know what I'm saying. I'm right, just going to leave it there because <laughs> big brother. <laughs> I don't want to be labeled medical misinformation again. <laughs> so <laughs> out of, um, so behavior, comparison, condemning, you know, this is what the Pharisees was, and that's why Jesus called them hypocrites, and that's why he couldn't stand them. He's like, you guys just took the most beautiful thing that me and my father designed, this relationship with you, and you made it into a 600 rule book that makes no sense, that it was just made up by you. And now you're using it to compare yourself with people and to judge people and to tell them what's wrong with them and all the stuff. He's like, he was, you know, Jesus was more mad at religious Pharisees than he was at sinners. He wasn't mad at sinners. He had compassion for people. But the ones that really got to him were the Pharisees. <clears throat> you know, the best way to keep people from looking at your behavior is to fa find fault with theirs. That's what the Pharisees did, did. You know, the Pharisees, Pharisees they, uh, they were looking at everybody else's behavior, right? Because it's a great self-defense mechanism, you know? If I keep telling all of you what's wrong with you, I never have to look at my behavior. It takes the spotlight off of me, right? In Luke chapter 17, uh, Jesus points to them, and he points to them towards the inside where they wouldn't be looking, you know. It, uh, they're like, where's the kingdom going to come from, you know. And Jesus is like, the kingdom is not going to come by observation. The kingdom is already within you. Amen. And he points the Pharisees to the very place where they did not want to look here. Isn't that crazy? He pointed them in to the very place that they didn't look for. They didn't look at their heart. You know, they're looking at everything else. They're like, where's the kingdom coming, you know? And then Jesus also compares them to like, um, uh, like, like someone who washes the outside of a cup, but not the inside. And so Pharisees are like all clean on the outside, you know? But the inside has like rotten milk and, you know, old coffee and your kid's cereal that they use, you know, the cup for. You know, and then the outside looks awesome. It's shiny and everything. And just saying, like, that's the Pharisees right there. Those are the religious people. You know, they, they didn't, they never look at the inside. They're only worried about the outside. They're externalists. And they don't look at the heart because their heart is dirty. Their inside is a mess. You know? And so that's, that's a, a, um, in Matthew uh, chapter 7, uh, we're going back there in verse 3. It says, um, when, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye, eye when you have a log in your own? <sighs> Judgment is a tremendous defense mechanism. They're always focused on others in order to avoid their own issues. In the name of ministry, many people have made it their agenda to fix other people, taking over the job of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we, if we have to be mentoring and coaching and teaching and, and fixing other people as a distraction, you know, and we haven't looked inside, then we're as good as a Pharisee. Oh, man, nobody likes to hear that. Okay. It's not our job to 
fix people, but to feed them. You know, I, I, I say that the best way to disciple people, because Jesus did tell us to make disciples, okay? That is a direct command. You know, but the simplest form of discipling people, it's, it's by as you grow, as you learn, as you eat, then you feed others. Just like a mom who would cook, she wouldn't cook just for herself. She would cook for the whole family, you know? And so as you eat, you know, you're qualified, Feed others. Hey, guess what? I just learned this amazing thing at church about judgment, you know? And this is what I'm practicing. This is what I'm working on. You're amazing at discipling. If you can do that, you're discipling people. You're not pointing out what's wrong with them. You're not comparing yourself with them. You are actually looking at your heart first and then sharing from that and saying, you know what? Like, I, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm dealing with. And it's amazing what God will do, you know? I, you should try it. That's a good way to disciple, right? As you grow, as you feed yourself, you feed others. And there's no need to fix them. Because you're looking at your heart. You're, you're dealing with your own heart at the same time that you're discipling other people. And you, you're not trying to fix someone else just to avoid looking at you. <clears throat> it's not our job to fix people, but to feed them and to lead them into godly transformation. The God we believe in is the God that we'll show to the world. So if you believe God is judging, you're going to be pretty judgy. If you believe God's angry, you're going to, you know, that's the God you're going to present to people. Like, man, watch out, you know, just I'm saying, watch your step. Because God, you know, when he loses his cool, he, I mean, he opens up the earth and swallows people. Like, we don't want another flood, so watch it, you know. Like, if you believe that, that that's God is the angry God, like, you're going to present that, that same thing. If you believe God's a punishing God, then you're going to act like the God that you believe in, and you're going to be a punisher of people. Nobody here punishes anybody, right? Silent punishment. No? You didn't answer my text, so now I'm ghosting you for a week. Oh. You don't give me a hug, so I don't even look your way anymore. Right? And, and all, the, all these little things that we start accumulating and we become punishers. Let me tell you, if you believe in a God whose love is unconditional, whose arms are always wide open, you're going to also reflect that to people and be the same thing to people. And you're going to present people to a loving God who loves you unconditionally, who, who is full of mercy, who's full of grace, who's not judging or waiting to punish us. <clears throat> if you think the voice of criticism and condemnation inside your head is the voice of God, uh oh, you will be critical and condemning of others too. You know, it's, it's, it's like that's not God, that's your guilty conscience. Or that's the enemy, the accuser, right? But if you believe that's God and that's how he speaks to you, then you're going to think it's okay to also be critical and condemning to others. But that voice of criticism and condemnation is not God's voice. We show people the God that we've made in our own image. And just to remind you, that's idolatry. We will show people the God that we've made in our own image. Like the Old Testament that says, you know, do not have any other gods before me. Images. And we make God into our own image, right? And then we present that God. And that's not him. Externalists are afraid to look into their hearts because they need to keep the focus outward for fear of what they might see inside. You know, that cup right there. It's been a long time since you, since you washed the inside. You're so scared to even smell that thing. <laughs> you just want to chuck it into the trash can, right? Can't tell you how many. Oh, this is kind of gross. How many parents are here? Okay. How many sippy cups with rotten milk have you pulled out of the very back seat of the van or the car? You don't even wash that cup. You just like, pff, you roll down the window on the 60, boom, out, you know, you're like, bomb. Like, you don't, no, I'm just kidding, I've never done that. I have never done that, <laughs> promise. You know, sometimes I, yeah, okay. But you can't do that with your heart. I'm sorry to tell you this. You cannot do that with your heart. 
You can't chuck it because it's like, ah, I need, blah. You have to look in there, you know. You have to look in there. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to heal the pain of the past. If you don't cultivate that garden, nobody is going to cultivate that garden for you. We'll help you cultivate that garden. Holy Spirit will do it. But if you don't do it, nobody else will. Nobody else can, you know. <sighs> All right. Um, but if we feel the love and the acceptance of God, when you feel fully loved by God, fully accepted by God, then what do you do? You, you also give that same thing to others, right? Others feel loved and accepted. It's that unconditional love that, that sometimes is really hard to understand. You know, how can God love me regardless of everything, right? And, but that's the same attitude we need to have towards others. It's like, hey, I don't, I don't judge you. I don't judge you. I love you. God loves you. It's the same grace that I've received is the same grace that I freely give. <clears throat> Accepting the reality of God's love for me frees me from the need to find fault with others. Right? Perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And so if we're punishing, it's because there's fear. Okay? And so we need to go back to uh, the love that he has for us. We're like, no, no, no. I am safe and secure in your love. I don't, I don't need anything else. I am safe and secure in your love. And therefore, I can give that same thing to others. I don't have to judge them. I don't have to be mad at them. I don't have, you know, I'm just receiving that same love. And now I can give that same love. Externalists are afraid to look in their hearts. Let's not be like that. Let's deal with our hearts. It's really hard when you've had so much breakthrough and so much victory and so much growth and to look at someone you love and they're stuck because they haven't dealt with their heart, right? And we want to help them, but, but we can't fall in the mistake of fixing them. Mm. We need to believe in people more than they believe in themselves. When you believe in someone... Um, you become safe for them. And then people open up. It's hard to believe in someone when you have a judgment against them. So if you're having a hard time believing in somebody, it's because you have a judgment against them. You're so disappointed in them. Oh, you're so disappointed because you have a judgment against them. We need to let go of those judgments. We keep our love on. We could be safe for them, and we could believe in them again, you know? Love believes all things. That's one of the definitions of love, is it believes all things. So I believe that even though history and track record shows all this, I believe that you can change. I believe that you can be set free. I believe that you're better than that. I believe what God says about you. <sighs> Even though I see all this bad fruit, even though I see all this behavior, I'm going to believe in you still. Because if, if, if we don't believe in people, who's going to believe in them? You know, like if we have, we are the ones that have God's love. We are the ones that, you know, know a God of unconditional love. Like if we don't believe in them, who's going to believe in them? Right? Hmm. And so, um, you know, where it says in verse 3, it said, Why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now, sometimes people think that this means that you never help your friend. And that's not what it means. What it's saying is says, first deal with your heart so that you helping people is not really fixing people or a defense mechanism. Okay? This does not mean don't help people. It means deal with your heart first so that you're helping people 
doesn't become a pharisaical defense mechanism that only looks at the outward in order to not address what's inside here. Okay, just Carlos got it, so I'm going to say this again. <laughs> Many times we get this, and we think this says, you know, you know, stay out of people's business. Don't, don't help anyone. Okay, well, that's not truth either. What it's saying is so that it doesn't become that defense mechanism that I'm just helping everybody, which is really fixing, right? So that it doesn't become a, a distraction from dealing with my own heart. It says, first, deal with your issues. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to be perfect, okay? Because I just described, like, discipleship is like, as you're growing, you'll know, point others. But our motivation is different, and we're no longer just saying, here, I'm, I'm going to help everybody without dealing with me first. And it's saying, first, where'd it go? Verse 5, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So you will then see good enough to help others, okay? So in other words, I, I'm like, like, I can't go and try to help you in your marriage if mine is falling apart. Even though I know, I know the love languages, I know all the... You know, all the personalities, I know all this stuff. I could give you great information, but mine's falling apart. Because then I'd be trying to be bigger on the outside than I'm on the inside. I don't ever want to be bigger on the outside than I'm on the inside. That's a scary place to be in, okay? But when I first deal with the log in my heart, okay, then I can, you know, see better, right? It's like a single person trying to help, you know, some, someone who's married for 20 years. Yeah. Let me tell you what you need to do. <laughs> like someone with no kids, you know, trying to teach parenting. Here's the thing. I can't... If, if, if part of this is saying you kind of need to know what you're talking about. That's why some people have uh, a greater influence or authority in some areas, right? Like, I, I, can, I can give hope, and I can pray for a drug addict, and I can certainly give them principles. I've never walked that walk. So somebody who has that testimony, you know, would, would be better equipped to help someone like that. I'm not saying I can't, Okay. Like, I got to go through that journey now so, now so I can help more people. No, you know. If you don't have any kids, then you should probably have kids before you start trying to help someone with their own kids. And it, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, God wants us to care and love for one another and to help one another. But, but I can't do that if, you know, if I haven't dealt with my heart first. You know? Do I have to be perfect? No, I don't have to be perfect. You know, but I, uh, I'm going to tell you this. I am, me and Kara are both people that are constantly, constantly cultivating our heart. You know, saying, search me, oh God. Search me, oh Lord. Only you know my heart. God knows my heart better than I know my heart. And so I say, Lord, you know, I see this in my life. Is there something there that you want to heal? You know, is there a past pain? Is there, is there something, you know, that is hurting from the past that I'm, that I'm, currently living, you know, and projecting onto my future. I want that healed. And the last thing is um, the judgments that we have towards God, you know. And we've, we've made judgments towards God. And when we have a judgment towards God, we, we're kind of missing out, you know, because we put distance between us and God. You know, it, we, we, we become that person that's like, I, you know, I... I love God and I and I serve God, you know, but you know, he really doesn't like me. And you say he really doesn't like me because you have a past painful experience or you had an expectation of how something was going to be and it didn't go that way and now you've made a judgment towards God that goes against his word that, you know, like, well, I guess God isn't really the healer because he didn't heal me when I 
needed him to heal me, how I needed him to heal me, how I thought it should have happened, you know. And so we can, you know, that, that was, uh, Josh, can you come up? And that, that was kind of, um, that was a big one for me, you know, uh, when I had the accident in 2021. And um, because, remember, I traveled the world seeing cra- the craziest miracles, instant miracles, like blind eyes open, deaf ears open, the paralyzed walking, you know. Uh, just a few weeks ago in Mexico, we saw... Uh, children with flat feet, right on the spot, their their feet got arches, and they went like this, bloop, and the moms were like crying. They're like, what? That was not there. That was not there, right? And so we've seen and we believe the, the, the creative miracles of God, but uh, when you are expecting the same thing to happen for you and it doesn't, what do you do? We, there's a couple options. You either make a judgment against God, and you go, well, I guess not everything there is true. Or maybe he just doesn't like me. Or maybe I did something wrong. Or maybe I'm not holy enough. Or, right? And we start making all these judgments against God or against ourselves. Because of uh, some disappointment. You know, but we have to remember that God's word never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we haven't experienced something that's in his word, we continue to stand on his word till our experience rises up to the level of his word. But we never make theology based on our experience and to water down the word of God to the level of what we have experienced. Because when we do, it's because we've made a judgment. And we've made a judgment against God, you know, and so like, well, you know, he didn't do this. So so he must not be happy with me. He must not love everyone. He must not. And we start making judgments against against his character. And when we do judgments against his character, you know, it, it, uh, it starts robbing from us. 